Hi there. In this lecture, we see an absolutely epic encounter, Akiba Rubenstein against Jose Raul Capablanca. So this is in the 1911 San Sebastian tournament, round 13. So would it be lucky for someone or unlucky for someone? Let's see, D4 by Rubenstein, D5, Knight F3, C5. So in this tournament, Capablanca was playing the Tarash defence. The Tarash does get peace activity at the expense of pawn structure sometimes. We have e6, we have c takes d5, e takes d5, knight c3, knight c6, and now g3. This is used greatly today against the Tarash. So Rubenstein kind of pioneered this move, g3. And if we look at even world chess championship matches, Karpov against Kasparov, Kasparov had to give up the Tarash defence. He was having a bad time with it. He moved to the Grunfeld defence. And it's the Rubenstein variation which you know Karpov often chooses. So G3, great move here. We have Bishop E6, Bishop G2. It provides king safety for white, tries to neutralise black's counterplay a bit. We have Bishop E7, white castles, rook C8, D takes C5. So black gets a nice late queen's pawn. But active bishop, looking at f2, that can be dangerous. Now here, a great decision, knight g5. So white is not obsessed with keeping black with the isolated queen's pawn. There's a more exploitable advantage sometimes to be had by just taking out the light square bishop to try and weaken the light squares later. So knight f6, knight takes e6. And this is also you know, a carp off recipe to take out on e6 in some key games. Black is... A little bit weaker now on the light squares but also black has this dynamic f file which can help the bishop later potentially we have bishop h3 e4 is an interesting move here if d takes queen b3 and you can see that white well, should overall be better so here e3 is an attempt to generate some play but overall white well, ends up being better in this position small edge d4 is problematic for black after knight a4 and e5 this position queen g4 and e6 is very vulnerable so here this is unfortunate for black losing castling rights what will be better here overall so anyway bishop h3 though was played which is also a move which creates some problems for black queen e7 and now bishop g5 here again e4 is really interesting it's more interesting than usual white has the light square bishop without a counterpart black is more fragile than light squares if d4 in this position can you see a resource for white for 10 points yeah knight d5 is possible here after e takes bishop takes c8 there's not enough for black losing the exchange here queen b3 check queen takes b7 as well picking up b7 as well not enough for black white's uh, doing very well there so bishop g5 though was played black castled and already there's a very interesting tactic bishop takes f6 was played but actually there's something even more accurate and pretty clear here with the bishop looking across this diagonal can you guess what it is 10 points knight takes d5 because if e takes there's bishop takes f6 as one example and queen takes d5 check bishop takes c8 and there's no problem here for white whites essentially the exchange up and, and going to be consolidating if we look at this again if queen f7 bishop takes f6 g takes this is just better for white rook c1 and here knight f4 looking at e6 it's just better for white and black's closed up that f file counterplay so yes it seems as though knight takes d5 is pretty strong here fascinating so anyway bishop takes f6 is played which is a bit of the wrong move order because there's pressure now it's like and help black a bit with this f file and f2 we have knight takes d5, queen h6, inaccuracy. 
Bishop takes f2 check seems better with Queen h6. And here, King g2, Black has Bishop takes g3, and after h takes, Rook takes f1, Queen takes f1, Rook f8, Queen c1, as example, e takes d5, Queen takes h6, g takes Bishop e6 check, King g7. This is a, a long line, isn't it? And white ends up being slightly better here. But it seems, you know, an interesting shot, Bishop takes f2. It wouldn't have been available if, you know, the different move order. If, if you look at this, this is like, there's an expression, sometimes to take is a mistake, from a, which uh, it does help black a bit here, but you know, knight takes d5. Yeah, it's just a little bit more accurate for you know, helping black on the f-file. So anyway, we have, though, in this situation, Queen h6 being played. Now, Kepelenko is really just going for peace activity. It's a little bit uncharacteristic for Kepelenko to use the opening stage just to get very active pieces to, to try and demonstrate tactical skills, in effect. And it's a problem if he's out calculated. And here, yeah, it does seem that there are there are problems here. Oh, you know, if white plays inaccurately, but white didn't white play king g two, which is showing an out calculation of Kapilenka. If bishop g2, the point would be 95. And in fact, black is now threatening not just to pin the knight, but also knight g4, looking at h2 and looking at f2. And you can see all the dynamic aspects of black's peace activity. Kamperblank is playing the role of a hacker here. And the thing is, this is rather dangerous. <laughs> if e3 to stop knight g4, then rook d8. And here, rook takes d5. Bishop takes, e takes d5, queen takes, and you can see that white is actually chatmated. <laughs> there's, 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 there's peace activity here, basically. If e3, and if h4, you might think rook f d8, this position, bishop f8, and the thing is, black's going to get material here, black's just material up. There's not enough white here. And if rook c1, let's have a look at rook c1, queen takes c1, ouch. <laughs> queen takes c1, bishop takes f2 check, and white's had it. White's just material down here. So yeah, this move by Rubenstein is really, really good. King g2. And it seems logical as well, as well keeping the bishop on a good diagonal, you know, to, to look at the rook, getting the king on the light square away from the dark square bishop seems a logical move as well so we have rook cd8 and here is the move which Campolanka basically missed which echoes also a move rubenstein beat laska with as well this is quite fascinating this move i mean if inst instead of rook cd8 if knight e5 knight f4 is good and look at e6 you know e6 is going to drop if e takes queen takes d5 check and c and bishop takes c8 first and here yeah black's had it so rook cd8 so the key move here for 500 points what would you play here what do you think the iconic move is in this position it's queen c1 it's really really nifty it's looking at the unprotected piece it's looking to exchange queens it's very powerful so e takes is played, e takes d5. If rook takes d5, white plays queen takes h6, weakening e6. So bishop takes e6, check, and just taking out d5. If queen takes c1, bishop takes e6, check, rook a takes c1, no problem. White's got a big advantage. Knight d4, queen takes h6, g takes knight c7 is annoying for black. If rook f6, e3, this position. Black's getting in big trouble. Losing e6 here, it's not good news. It's like two pawns down for black. 
So e takes was tried. Queen takes c5. White is a solid pawn up. Queen d2. Queen b5. Now here, Bishop g4 may be a little bit more accurate. So d4, this position, Queen takes b2, Rook b1, Queen c3. As example, this position is better, persistently better for white. Even though white's given back the pawn, there's trouble here after Bishop f3. This position, Bishop takes c6, b takes, Rook takes c6 is a nice tactic. So white's again a pawn up and this pawn's vulnerable in the end games the king coming to collect that pawn on d4 you'd expect so queen b5 though was played we have knight d4 queen d3 this does force the queens off if queen a4 instead knight takes e2 this is also another way of playing it where white is actually ending up funny enough being better in this situation with authority on the position but it's giving the pawn back it seems counterintuitive to a human to do that so queen d3 seems an intuitive move we have queen takes d3 if queen takes b2 rook fb1 and here just picking up the knight if queen b4 instead a3 and actually safest is b4 As example, any time the knight steps back, bishop e6, check, bishop takes d5. This should be very nice for white. Now, if we try and be more forcing than b4, you might think, why, why b4? So let's go back now. Why b4? Or isn't isn't there a more clear cut way of doing this? Instead of a3, why not just play rook fd1? The thing is, here white should play rook d2 to be on the safe side again we've got to be wary of black's piece activity if we play bishop e6 check we've got to be aware of pins look at f2 and look at this pin black can play queen c5 with play so here you know queen c4 rook takes f2 we don't want to give black play so anyway yeah in all variations it seems as though white's better essentially but white has to be sometimes less greedy than you'd expect so anyway e takes d3 and we have here rook f e8 bishop g4 rook d6 rook f e1 pair of rooks come off rook b6 trying to get some play on the queen side if king f7 rook c1 and white's better look at that coming to c7 potentially sometimes so rook b6 we have rook e5 b3 is also possible you know this position is better for white so rook e5 we have rook takes b2 rook takes d5 knight c6 bishop e6 check king f8 rook f5 check king e8 now if king e7 bishop b3 is good with rook f7 coming and then this is just good for white there's no problem here to give up f2 black's queenside pawns are left you know, it's just one there <laughs> and it's just better for white two connected pass pawns over here so king e8 we have bishop f7 check king d7 bishop c4 a6 rook f7 check King d6, rook takes g7, b5. Bishop g8, a5. Rook takes h7, a4. Now, it looks as though, well, black's in trying to get a dangerous pass pawn. h4, b4. Rook h6, check. King c5. Rook h5, check. King b6. And now a slight inaccuracy. Bishop d5 is played, which looks logical to try, you know, go for rook h6 and stuff. It turns out here that rook f5 is a very strong move and as example it unlocks the potential of the pawn it also it supports rook f4 i did to try and save any dangerous scenarios against past pawns here a takes rook and b4 here actually and actually white is prepared 
to give up the bishop because the past pawns over here h5 this is just too strong for white the past pawns to g4 the, the past pawns are crashing through the knight's helpless against them so rook f5 would have been a super strong move in the game bishop d5 we have b3 being played and and this since this game have found that black actually has a very interesting resource here which needs like a problematic solution for white to actually retain the advantage instead of b3 can you see what this stunning resource find is for 100 points for black yeah funny enough rook takes a2 and um, white should play rook h8 if bishop takes a2 b3 this position a3 and you can see that black's actually swindled it completely so we will have to go with rook h8 and if b3 h5 rook a1 to unpin the pawn for b2 coming and here there's only one way for white to win this this is a bit ridiculous and strange this situation in this variation what would white play here for 100 points funny enough white has to play rook c8 for advantage if bishop takes c6 king takes this position is going to be actually about equal here it's even it ends up being even but yeah so rook c8 is important b2 rook takes c6 check king b5 if king a5 in this version yeah bishop c4 and here check check taking up b1 and the bishop's well positioned for these pass pawns to be winning if instead of king b5 yeah sorry if that was on king a5 so this position we, we've just said is better but what if king b5 then rook c8 this position there's only one move here this is really ridiculous stuff <laughs> what would you play here the only move for winning technically is actually for 100 points bishop c4 check to secure the bishop on c4 protected protected piece then check then take out the queen and this is winning for white to h6 g5 it's winning for white if we don't actually play bishop c4 check if bishop c4 check isn't played if rook b8 check is played rook takes b1 bishop c4 then this position it's not quick enough the pawns are not quick enough here black rescues the situation for example this situation a2 rook takes a2 is just going to be inferior draw it's really really funny stuff but anyway in a nutshell rook takes a2 provides a wealth of interesting resources based on black's past pawn potential so that could have all been avoided if on move 38 rook f5 had been played but yeah in the event yeah we have this bishop d5 but in the game b3 was played not rook takes a2 so we have uh, a takes b3 a3 <laughs> please excuse the large amount of analysis i mean it's like the world has drawn attention to this game it's in loads of people's games collections it's an iconic clash so it deserves a little bit more analysis than usual so a3 we have bishop takes c6 rook takes b3 if a2 then rook b5 check and here rook b8 a1 rook, rook a8 check picking up a1 winning for white so rook takes b3 bishop d5 we have a2 and now guess what ends the game yeah rook h6 check ends the game black resigned if rook h8 
this position is actually funny enough also a winning position for white the queen isn't enough by herself it's technically winning if bishop takes b3 again this is technically winning for white it's quite cozy for white it should be absolutely winning for white but this is really neat rook h6 check if king a5 bishop c4 so we've got rook a6 check support so if a1 rook a6 check rook takes a1 yeah so yeah this is crushing and also you know rook h8 is also is, is good for rook a8 taking out a2 as well so yeah a fascinating encounter and we can see Rubenstein's influence against the terrorist defense which echoes in later generations this whole system with the fianchetto it's actually representative of something more significant the static kind of positional players being able to use an opening to neutralize counterplay potential with the fianchetto providing king safety and trying to disprove black's bid quite ambitious bid for peace activity so the terrorist defense nowadays generally hasn't got a great reputation with modern you know grandmasters especially super grandmasters the, the the terrorist is treated with suspicion and it's largely to do with this you know Rubenstein variation with the fianchetto so yeah he's an he's a kind of Mike Sparrow he's, he's called Rubenstein one of the fathers of modern chess for good reason there's so many powerful opening variations which have still persist today and you know basically help dent the popularity of the whole of the you know, Tarash defense and also in particular you know, Cav Blanca if he didn't play the Tarash after this tournament and this was one of the games influencing that decision to drop the Tarash you know otherwise it, it does seem a great way for black to get peace activity but yeah the the way that Rubenstein also approached taking out e6 here is very instructive and has been used by later generations like Karpov it seems paradoxical that you think the way to exploit a nice set of Queen's pawn and oh, routinely blockade it sometimes there's another plan you just take out the light square bishop and play on the light squares and Karpov has had you know game symphonies based on light squares after there's a you know classic games of Karpov in this with this theme so yeah a very in interesting influential game I hope you've enjoyed this game as much as me thanks very much all comments questions likes and subscribes really appreciated thanks very much